Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voison, the host of Inside Personal Growth. And Thais, every time I come on these shows, I probably sound like a broken record because I just, I thank the listeners. And you know, because you do podcasts and shows and you're on YouTube and you're out there, but joining us uh, from Toronto, Canada is Thais Gibson. And Thais is going to be speaking with us uh, about her new book. Thais, good day to you. How are you? Hi, Greg. I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for having me here today. Well, it's a pleasure having you on. And this whole personal development school, which we'll be giving our listeners uh, links to that in there, and your uh, book, The Attachment Theory, uh, which we'll be talking about here um, it's really fascinating to me, and your background as to how you got here is also quite fascinating. I'm going to let our listeners know a little bit about you. Thais Gibson's an author, speaker, and co-creator of the Personal Development School. Uh, she's extremely passionate about personal growth and the subconscious mind and connecting with others. Uh, with an MA in over 13 different certifications, ranging from CBT to hypnosis, Thais strives to continuously learn and grow. Uh, she's best known for contributing work and research on attachment theory and the impact of attachment trauma on our adult romantic relationships. She overlaps attachment trauma challenges with her personal core wounds, limiting beliefs, and emotional patterns at the subconscious level to give us deeper insight in ourselves and our relationships. And her book, The Attachment Theory Guide, was written on the topic, and her YouTube channel uh, often focuses on educating people on how to subconsciously reprogram this area of their lives. Um, she overcame addiction in her early years and is profoundly determined to educate people on how they can reprogram painful or limiting programs in their own mind, and she focuses on helping people Retrain the brain uh, to achieve relationship fulfillment, abundance, and personal freedom in their lives. Well, you've got an amazing mission, and you are a woman on a mission, I can tell. Uh, for those of you who want to learn more about it, go to www.personaldevelopmentschool.com. Uh, that's a place where you can reach her. Facebook is PDS uh, Thais Gibson, and that's T-H-A-I-S-G-I-B-S-O-N. You can reach her there. Thais, you know, in the in your book, This Attachment theory, uh, theory, A Guide to Strengthening the Relationships in Your Life, you've broken this attachment theory into three sections. And I think it might be useful for the listeners to better understand a little about, you know, your history, the origin of the book, and a little bit about the tools, because that can set a foundation for our interview. So would you be willing to uh, explore with our listeners uh, what that's all about? Absolutely. So thank you for that wonderful intro as well. So um, basically, attachment theory was studied originally by a, a psychologist named John Bowlby and, and later studied by Mary Ainsworth. And basically, attachment theory predicted the way that children attach to their caregivers and you know, developing research took that and said the early attachment patterns we develop between ourselves and our caregiver in our childhood actually has a dramatic impact on our adult romantic relationships as well as our adult friendships and other family relationships. So we can think of, you know, our attachment style as the subconscious set of rules that we play by when we enter into relationship with others. And the analogy I often share with people is, you know, if you are, let's say, in a romantic relationship with somebody with a different attachment style, it would be sort of synonymous to playing a board game with somebody. And both of you have a totally different set of rules about how the board game works. And so obviously it can create, you know, friction in, in different people. But what's really important to, to realize is that just because we have a set of rules that were imprinted upon us in early childhood and these different subconscious programs that we created from the imprints that we received doesn't mean that the rules that don't serve us or the rules that might cause arguments or friction or challenges can't be reprogrammed and can't be changed. And so we have four different attachment styles overall. One attachment style is secure. 
And secure people basically in their childhood learn that when they express feelings, you know, they cry, usually they get tended to. So they learn that their feelings are okay. It's safe to feel their feelings. It's safe to express their feelings. And they also learn that when they express feelings, their needs often get met. You know, if they're crying, maybe the caregiver comes in and wants to, you know, feed them or coddle them or take care of them. So they basically have these two really important cornerstones that say, my feelings are worthy of being seen, heard, understood, and my needs are worthy of being met. And you can imagine if those are the early imprints you have, you feel like it's safe to relate to others. It's safe to be vulnerable. It's safe to feel and express your emotions. It's safe to express your needs and have them met. And so we end up having more confidence as individuals, greater feelings of self-worth, et cetera. And then we have three insecure attachment styles who don't get the same patterning. And these three insecure attachment styles are um, dismissive avoidance, which are individuals who go through a certain degree of emotional neglect. And these individuals often experience um, feeling like they can't express their emotions and they can't soothe through others. And they become very independent. And, and in these people's adult lives, what you'll often see is that they fear commitment. They fear vulnerability. They don't want to express too much or share too much because they've learned at a very early age it doesn't feel safe. And then we have anxious, preoccupied individuals, which is sort of the polar opposite to a certain degree, where they don't learn to develop enough independence. They only feel empowered to soothe through the caregiver. And so in their adult lives, they often feel very anxious in relationships. They fear abandonment. They fear loss. They fear being disconnected. And sometimes they can, that can express itself as being very clingy in their adult lives. And then we have fearful avoidance who are sometimes also referred to as anxious avoidance because they sort of experience both ends of the attachment spectrum on the insecure side. So they have their moments of fearing abandonment and disconnection. And then they also have their, their fears of being too vulnerable and too dependent on others. And they're constantly sort of swinging back and forth. And fearful avoidance are often characterized by also struggling with different trust wounds and a lot of hypervigilance. And so these early mm-hmm. ways we relate, you know, you can imagine now how those different attachment styles, somebody dismissive avoidant who wants lots of space and somebody anxious, preoccupied, who wants lots of closeness, you can imagine how that's naturally going to create friction in a relationship and how the mind will interpret that in, in slightly painful ways. Well, you know, it's interesting what you say. And I think for our listeners, you covered a lot in a very short period of time. And it's going to be much to take in. Now, for me to understand maybe where I was, I've noticed that you have a quiz uh, that's at your website. It's also in the book. Um, Does this quiz that you have help us ascertain where we are as individuals and then really what it is that we can do to um, uh, kind of fix, I wouldn't say fix the style, but at least cope with it. Absolutely. So, so the quiz itself is on the website. It's free. And once you take it, we actually have an automated report that goes out based on your results. So you get an attachment style report with um, the different attachment patterns you have, and also pre-recorded videos by myself that explains more about the attachment style specifically. And there's also a tremendous amount of free content on YouTube in there. Um, so there's a lot of information to sort of help people get started. And we, we can cope with it, absolutely. But we can also transform, like, you know, our attachment style basically comes with a certain set of core wounds. So imprints that the subconscious has experienced in, in early life. And so we might see, for example, that the anxious, preoccupied individual has these core wounds, these beliefs that they think are going to take place. You know, I am, I am going to be abandoned. I am going to be left alone. Um, I am unsafe. I am unlovable or unloved. Um, I am not good enough. I will be rejected. And, and so we have these core wounds. And, and once we can reprogram those core wounds within ourselves, and, and, you know, there's many different tools to do so. And once we can start learning to express our needs, feel our feelings, soothe ourselves, work through the stories that we tell ourselves, work through strategies to get our needs met. Once we do all of these things, we can really go beyond just coping and we can actually reprogram and and change our attachment style to actually become secure individuals. And, you know, this spills into all areas of life. It it spills into our friendships, our romantic relationships, our family connections and relationships, how we parent our own children, how we show up in the workplace with our colleagues, how we feel about expressing ourselves to others. It really has sort of a net 
output on all different of the seven areas of life. Well, you know, ACT uh, or acceptance and commitment therapy has been around for quite some time. And we've had other guests on the show, professors that teach it and so on. And I know that's one of the things that you really got into besides neuro-linguistic programming and uh, emotional-based therapies. Um, you know, your background is right there to do that. Can you speak with the, the audience about acceptance and commitment therapy as a means to kind of cope with arguments within romantic partners, friends and families? And tell us a little bit more about how the acceptance and commitment theory kind of works. How do how do we or I should say therapy, not theory, but the therapy works because there's a lot of talk about it, you know. Um, but I'm not certain people are really well aware of how this works. Absolutely. So one of the things I loved about ACT in relationship to attachment theory is that um, one of the first, you can sort of break it down into two major components, which is number one, acceptance of life instead of being in resistance and commitment to, to the values, to living by the values of how you want to show up. And these two sort of founding characteristics are, are, sort of um, accompanied by this underlying third component, which I like to refer to as diffusing, and, and ACT often refers to, which is the ability to look at thoughts instead of look from thoughts. So when we break this down, you know, there's there's a, an analogy I often use, which is, you know, the moment you realize you registered something that's happened in the past or, or something that's happening in your current experience. So let's say, for example, you're you're driving and you have a flat tire. The moment you realize the tire is flat, it is now the past. And it might be the immediate past, but it's still the past. And we can't change the past. So there's no point in fighting with with the flat tire. There's no point in going, oh, my gosh, why is my tire flat? How could this happen to me? All we do when we start thinking that way and we're in resistance to the past is we, we fight a losing battle because we will always lose against reality and, and what is. Um, and we also put our emotional resources and energy into fighting something that we actually have no control over. And so the moment we choose an attitude of acceptance, we now have the opportunity to put our mental emotional resources towards solving a problem, towards um, changing the dynamic of the situation. And when this comes to attachment theory and the differences between people, sort of going back to that analogy of a board game and a different set of rules, if we're resisting how other people are acting. If we're judging and going, no, they should be acting this way. They should be behaving that way. Really, we, we stop seeing that person and we, we put them into a box of how we think they should be. And, and they should be the character in my play or the doll that I choose is how they're going to react or a puppet. And, and it's a, a horrible way to really disconnect from people. And so when we start accepting and choosing acceptance, not only do we stop putting our mental emotional resources towards literally nothing when we're in resistance, but we start being able to open and see people more clearly for who they are, for their differences, for their programming. And it creates a space to connect and understand. And whenever we try to intentionally understand, the automatic response is compassion. Because intentional yeah. understanding creates that compassionate outcome. And it's, it's a beautiful first step. And then when we can witness our reaction to a situation by looking at thoughts instead of from thoughts, okay? And, and the analogy I often use for that piece is, you know, it, emotions are never bad. Thoughts are never bad. It's the way we use them or respond to them that becomes painful. So if somebody gets mm-hmm. angry, and they throw something, you know, chances are they were reacting through that anger. But if somebody gets angry and they witness it and they inquire and try to understand what's going on inside of them, that became a healthy way of dealing with anger. So anger is never right or wrong. Anger, you know, by by definition, our emotions are correct because they're guidance mechanisms. But when we act through anger and get angry or yell, that's an unhealthy way of dealing with it. If we inquire and observe and try to understand We also produce self-compassion as a result of that, and it creates constructive outcomes. And then if we can further that by then choosing to commit to how we want to show up when we're in a triggered situation by going, you know what, I want to um, be loving and supportive to to my partner right now, or I want to, um, you know, take something away from this situation. And if you can choose actions and behaviors based on the values that you have, 
it really sets this overall um, sort of space in which you can have productive outcomes in your relationships and situations. And when we're playing by different rules when it comes to attachment theory, having this overall attitude of acceptance and observation and commitment really allows us to have healthy and productive ways of communicating, getting our needs met, and it helps to bond people as they go through conflict instead of split them apart. Well, I think what you say about uh, ACT or acceptance and commitment um, is is so important. And I think, you know, look, it comes down to a Buddhist precept, which has been around, and it's around attachment. You know, if we can, as individuals, from a spiritual standpoint, let's look at this spiritually, um, stop resisting. Um, mm-hmm. When we say surrender, we don't mean surrender and give up. We mean <laughs> surrender those thoughts that are li- literally creating the resistance in your life. And what I'd really like to know is, what is it that particularly you would prescribe to one of our listeners who might be in a really uh, deep area of resisting? You know, people that are going through bad relationships, those bad relationships start through resistance, a resistance of the person, resistance of what they do, what they say, how they act. Uh, after a while, they can't stand them anymore. So how do you move somebody out of that in a relationship, Thais? It's a beautiful question. And, and I love I love that you mentioned, because I hear this all the time, the surrender isn't about giving up. It's about being able to surrender identification and be able to step out of your thinking and observe it and recognize what's going on. So the exact prescription, so to speak, that I would give to people is is first to to understand what's happening. So, and once we understand what's happening, then I'll I'll give a couple of clear steps. So first, what happens is we go through life and we have imprints in the subconscious and these imprints create belief patterns. So let's say, for example, um, you know, you, you go through childhood and you feel unseen and unheard because let's say mom and dad are very busy, you know, working a lot. You might make that mean that, oh, I'm, I'm not important or I don't matter. Or you might just have a wound around being unseen and unheard as a whole. And then these programs, which are now beliefs because of the meaning you've given to things, are now beliefs in your subconscious mind. These programs, you see the world through. So you assume, you know, that your subconscious mind is like the filter you observe things through. So now you assume that you don't really matter. And either you maybe try to cope with that by trying to make yourself big and, and speak up loud and, and try to get attention, or maybe you just withdraw together. But what happens is these beliefs produce patterns of thought. So if you think I don't matter, and then maybe you go into school and you don't want to raise your hand in class because you have all these thoughts like, oh, nobody's going to think my answer matters. Nobody thinks I have anything valuable to say. So the beliefs are like a tree trunk and they have tree branches that come off of them, which are our thoughts. So I don't matter. Oh, my opinion doesn't matter. Nobody cares to give me attention. Nobody's going to want to be with me in a relationship. They are like offshoots of that original painful imprinted belief. Now, these belief and thought patterns produce emotions. So how do you feel when you think those things? You might feel sad, withdrawn, disconnected, devastated. You know, you feel painful emotions. These emotions are made up of neurochemical reactions. Like if you have stressful thoughts, you've got more cortisol and, and norepinephrine. Um, if you have positively based thoughts and, and beliefs that serve you, you might have more serotonin or oxytocin if you feel bonded to people or dopamine. So these emotions then produce actions and these things will loop back around. And not only is the neurochemistry somewhat addictive, as research shows, but we also get locked into this loop because our subconscious mind likes familiarity. It doesn't want to change. So we can get really identified with our thoughts and we can believe them automatically. And a really important piece of information that everybody should know is that any passing thought that you have going through your mind on autopilot, your subconscious mind is emotionally buying into as if it's an absolute truth. So you go into a room full of people and you might not be able to, you might, you might matter to people, but if you're carrying this belief, I don't matter, you're living in the reality at that time where you truly don't matter to the people around you. And you're emotional. Well, you know, yeah, that, that actually brings up this question for me, and I, and I want to pose this because, you know, epigenetics is something that you cited in the book, and you cited this study that Carnegie Mellon did and the work done by uh, Bruce Lipton, who's been on our show before, 
about how gene expression in relation to the environmental factors. So in other words, how we're actually taking this on, and I don't think people realize this as much, but you know, when you look at what we're dealing with right now, even COVID, the fear, um, you know, if I think, you know, I know this may sound silly, but a lot of people out there that are dying are dying from fear. Okay. And that's an individual body. You say in this, that an individual's body cannot heal when it is in this sympathetic state. So what I'd like to do is because this therapy, ACT, can you tell us more about how these studies related to a, a CT, because it was, it was really fascinating. It was a part in your book where I think it's deep, but at the same time, if people understand it very simply a little better and you can, you know, articulate that, I think it would be good for them to know what they're actually doing to the chemistry and the genes in their body. You can yeah. actually change your genetic makeup of your body. That is so fascinating. It's so interesting. So, so, um, there's been a lot of research done about this and, and a wonderful teacher on this topic goes in, in depth and I think Dr. Joe Dispenza as well. And he talks about how we actually can change the expression of our genes on and off in a real time, like Christmas tree lights. That's, that's the, the exact quote. And he has a lot of, um, specific research around that. But, but basically, this study got, um, participants to go into an, an fMRI scanner and recall painful memories. And when they would recall painful memories, the reptilian brain was activated, they were in fight or flight mode, and obviously their sympathetic nervous system was triggered. And Dr. Bruce Lipton talks a lot about how we can't be in a space of healing and, you know, cell production and growth and a space of fight or flight at the same time. They are, in fact, mutually exclusive states, sympathetic and parasympathetic. So when, when they took these participants and put them in that scanner, then they had participants, once they're triggered and in that state, just witness and observe their, their emotions and label them. And just the act of doing that actually turned conscious processing back on and helped them to relax and witnessing put them back into parasympathetic nervous system mode quite quickly. And so it's a beautiful thing to be able to do because that's one way of regulating. And then what I found is Beyond that, once we can witness and, and stop acting through that cycle of beliefs, thoughts, emotions, actions, when we can witness and then question the stories we tell ourselves. So, you know, you walk into the room full of people and you think you don't matter. I don't matter to these people in the room or I don't matter to my friends and family or wherever you are projecting that old belief. Can I really truly know this with certainty? Can I truly know that I have no value as a human being or whatever stories we tell ourselves? Sometimes it's, I'm not good enough. I'm unloved. I'm going to be abandoned. When we can start questioning that story and, and changing it and trying to stop buying into those cognitive distortions, that further not only takes that emotional impact away because, you know, our beliefs and thoughts produce emotions, change the beliefs and thoughts, change the emotional reaction. But we really start regulating into parasympathetic when that emotional charge dies down. And then we start feeling like, oh, my gosh, I can relax. And we're not buying in. And the repetition of doing that, because the subconscious mind is programmed through repetition plus emotion, the repetition of doing that actually can put those belief and thought patterns to rest altogether. So they stop coming back in the same way. It It is. It's fascinating. And, you know, you state in the book, because, you know, look, relationships, uh, in the end of relationships is often due to conflict. But you state in the book that conflict is largely the result of an unmet need that mm-hmm. we are not consciously aware of. Um, and yes, I couldn't agree with you more. And the question is, where is that unmet need coming from? How would you recommend that if you are talking to my listeners right now, one-on-one doing a coaching with them, that they get in touch with that unmet need and really work through it. Because the key is not, the, okay, I'm aware of the unmet need. The key is I, I now have identified what the unmet need was, but how do I work through it to get to the other side to resolve the conflict? Beautiful. So um, one of the, the main sort of te- there's there's two things that cause emotional pain or suffering pain are unmet needs and usually the emotional charge around that is a five out of ten or less and pain is there specifically as a feedback mechanism to help us grow it's like if you know hundreds of thousands of years ago if we didn't have 
um, or thousands of years ago, if we didn't have um, this uh, a pain of hunger or if we didn't have a fear of survival, we might not have grown and adapted to our environment. So your emotions are going to, you're going to experience pain when you have unmet needs and that's forcing you to grow. It prevents us from stagnating. It's there to serve us. And then suffering is the story we tell about that need being unmet. So if we go, okay, um, you know, I have an unmet need for more connection in my life. And then if I tell a story around that and I say, oh, it's because I'm not good enough or people don't like me. Now I have emotional pain and suffering. The only two reasons we can experience emotional pain or suffering are because we either have unmet needs or we have painful belief and thought patterns. Outside of that, emotional suffering really wouldn't exist. So, so everything sort of boils down to those two categories. And, and when we have an unmet need, one of the first things we can ask ourselves is, is first we want to be able to observe the emotion and not act through the emotion and be like, okay, I'm in pain. What might be happening inside of me that I'm experiencing this pain? Am I telling myself a painful story? Or is there a need that I have that's unmet right now? And it might be both. And once you step out of that, observe yourself, ask yourself that question, the next thing you can ask is, what do I need in order to feel relief right now? And that's going to really clarify that unmet need for you. And then your last question is, what is a strategy I can use to support myself in getting that need met? So let's say you're in a, a conflict in a relationship, and let's say you feel that old wound of being unheard. And maybe you really want to communicate and, and share with your partner something you're feeling, but you, you feel like the person's, you know, dismissing it or, or not listening. You might go, oh, my gosh, I'm unheard. And that means I don't matter to my partner. So you want to challenge that first, that belief pattern. Can I really know that that's true? Or is it that the partner's busy or there might be something going on in their life right now? Do so you question the story and then you ask yourself, OK, and what do I need to feel relief? OK, I need to feel heard by this person. OK, what's a strategy to get that met? Okay, let me go up to them and say, hey, I really need five minutes of your attention. There's really something I want to share and communicate with you. And once we think consciously through that whole process, it's quite easy to get your needs met. Now, you have to sort of practice going through those steps over and over and really getting clear about it. But by, but by questioning our stories, being aware of our needs and coming up with strategies to get them met, we stop spiraling. And, and one of the big pieces of research that's out there says that, you know, when we feel like we can't communicate our needs or we don't have a way to bring them to the table, it often results in emotional volatility. And obviously that causes more problems in relationships. Well, one of the things that causes problems in relationships, and, and I'm not just saying that it's today, but over the eons of history has been sex. And obviously, as a counselor and therapist, you have to address this issue. And it's it's an unmet need on I, either partner's side. What are you experiencing now, you know, given talking to your clients and coaching them and, you know, this whole thing where we're homebound and people are, their emotions are higher and there's more conflict and uh, there seems to be either less drive or more drive, but it's always been a fascinating subject to me because it just seems like, you know, here is a, a need that needs to be fulfilled either side, but either the timing is wrong or the emotions aren't right. How do you tell people to kind of modulate or, or, or try and work on that? Yeah, it's a beautiful question because it, you're just raising such an important topic and, and something that has such an impact on relationships. So uh, there's a few parts to it. The first part I would say is that, believe it or not, our attachment style has a very strong correlation, not necessarily causation, but correlation with um, sex. For example, dismissive avoidance are often because they live in their head more. They don't want to be vulnerable as much. Usually as they get closer into relationships and they've been in them longer, they actually become more um, withdrawn from physical intimacy from sex um, than other attachment styles. Fearful avoidance tend to be more sexually driven. Anxious preoccupied tend to not be as present in sex, but they often want to please very much in sex and, and feel like, oh my gosh, if I'm good enough, I'll get love. And so often they struggle with orgasm in sex. There's, there's a lot of patterns I've observed over time. Um, and, and patterns, you know, they're not exactly, you know, 100% accurate for every single person, but I would say they're, they're quite strong, you know, like 80, 90% or more people sort of fit into those categories. And, and this is through case studies of, of hundreds of clients and students inside of our school that communicate these things. So sex itself 
um, is often a reflection of the intimacy in the relationship when you take attachment styles out of the picture. And so if somebody is feeling um, vulnerable, if somebody is feeling seen, heard, important, wanted, connected, often sex becomes a natural evolution of that. Because those are like the, you can think of them as the prerequisites to intimacy because they're the emotional, emotionally based intimate parts. But then if we look at like the, the stereotypical constructs in society, and, and this comes from a, a, a woman named Glennon Doyle Melton, and I, I heard this once and this really resonated. There's, there's research that so, shows, you know, men growing up are often emotionally shamed, right? So they learn to love through the body and they're often affirmed, you know, growing up in their teenage years, if, if they're, sleeping with other women or, you know, dating many women or things like that. And women are often shamed of their body, right? Like, oh, you have to look a certain way and, and your body has to be a certain way. And there's a lot of pressure there. So women often feel unsafe there and they learn to feel safe loving through the emotions. And so there can be this great disconnect, right? When when vulnerability and those ingredients of vulnerability are not present in a relationship, because if we don't have intimacy alive in the relationship in and of itself, in terms of feeling like we can communicate our needs to each other, feeling like we'll be heard by one another, feeling like we hold space for each other and accept each other's flaws and imperfections. If we don't have these necessary ingredients, then we often fall into these ruts that are either the different conditioning men versus women have or the different attachment style patterns and how they manifest in a romantic relationship. And then what takes place is if people feel like their sexual needs are unmet and they feel helpless to change that, Often what takes place is then, well, it's a, it's a basic human need that people have. It's, you know, not too far off from, from hunger and thirst and, and these different bodily functions. And then when we can't meet the need and we feel helpless, we get hopeless. And then we start resenting and then we start justifying. And we go, you know what? Well, my husband or my wife or my partner, they're not meeting the needs. So they don't care. I might as well just go do this outside of here. And these, when we have these resentments, when we have these unmet needs, and we're not feeling like we can communicate and resolve, the moment we get into helplessness, the mind then starts looking to meet these needs outside of the relationship or in different forms that can be healthy or unhealthy the vast majority of the time. And because the mind is a needs meeting machine, it's naturally going to start creating excuses to do things that might violate a relationship's boundaries. And so it's so important we start at the root and have those necessary ingredients alive in a relationship. And then we also introduce the ability to healthily communicate and talk about sex. You know, it's, we have so much shame around sex as a society, but like sex is a normal thing and, and it's okay to talk about what you want in sex and what's important to you and frequency and what it looks like. And when there isn't sex in a relationship, what can we do together? And, and it's an important conversation that needs to be had. Good point that you made. And I think that, you know, it's, it's it's so important all the time, but I think in particularly during these times and, you know, you and I are both uh, self-realization devotees and it always fascinates me that the monks, you know, when you look at somebody who's very deep spiritually, that whether it's a monk or a nun, that they're a celibate. Now we know there's been challenges with this, but then we also know, you know, you look at so many masters in this area about diverting that energy, right? Where mm-hmm. does that energy get diverted? And you look at that sexual energy and we do recognize that sexual energies can be diverted in different mm-hmm. directions because otherwise you wouldn't have these spiritual masters who've taken on a vow of celibacy to uh, become extremely spiritual. So I find all of that quite fascinating which leads me to you talk about CBT. So that's cognitive behavioral therapy. It's being used a lot now more than it was um, and being applied to relieve emotional suffering. Can you explain CBT, kind of how it works and the effects that our listeners might expect from emotional suffering as a result of using the CBT um, therapy? Absolutely. So CBT basically... Um, focuses on, on challenging really painful cognitive distortions that we come up with. And, and as a result, your emotional regulation gets improved. And then it works to also have healthy behavioral support systems that help to work on solving those current problems. So, so what I love about that specifically is that um, it, it sort of encompasses those two parts. It's like 
how can we challenge the cognitive distortion? So maybe so let's take Bob and let's say Bob was bullied as a child growing up. And let's say because of that bullying, he made that mean I'm not good enough and I'm not cool enough and smart enough and all these different things. Well, Bob is going to rerun that story, that cognitive distortion on autopilot all the time. And we want to focus on changing that story because as long as we believe that, we keep acting on what we believe and we keep, you know, basically keeping that, that situation alive in our life. And we want to think of how do you act when you, when you feel not good enough? Well, you might, um, you know, not speak up in a meeting. You might not ask for an opportunity in the workplace. You might not pursue the person that you really are attracted to. You, all these things can sort of pop up. And so when we have these, um, painful belief patterns and thoughts and we have these painful actions that accompany them it's like how can we challenge and question those painful distortions and then also have actions that we take that help us to practice you know maybe we want to evolve ourselves maybe we want to practice speaking up a little bit more and seeing that it's not so bad not so scary maybe we want to um you know practice setting boundaries and pursuing people we are interested in and taking those risks so it it really encompasses changing the way we think about things and perceive things, but also working to transform behavioral patterns so that we also knock out that imprint. Um, and, and in doing so, it helps to reprogram the entire subconscious mind over time through the repetition of, pl- of applying those things. Very, very uh, strong process. And one I know that you use with uh, your clients, uh, as well as many of these uh, techniques that you use. And mm-hmm. You came up with an acronym, and I know mindfulness is a big thing spoken about a lot. Meditation is spoken about a lot. The question is, is how many people are actually practicing it on a regular basis or mindfulness? And you introduced this four-step process. It's an acronym is RAIN, R-A-I-N. I was wondering if you could explain the process um, to help our listeners induce more mindfulness, because mindfulness will actually lead to better relationships. I always say, you know, look, all you've got is the now. If mm-hmm. if you if this is all you really have and if you can stay in the now and you can be mindful of it, why would you be resisting this uh this other person, right? Um <laughs> because the reality is your your ability what you're there for is to learn instead of resist and learn how you can make it better. So explain RAIN for us and how it brings mindfulness into relationships and how it can better our relationships. Absolutely. Um, so so RAIN, I, I, I didn't actually come up with the acronym myself, but um, it's, it's sort of a part of mindfulness. And it talks about recognize, allow, investigate, and then N stand for, stands for non-identification. And, and you know, I'm a, a big meditator myself, um, as I know you are as well. And, and um, the, the beauty about meditation is we can think of like the ego mind, the personality as all of these, these painful stories we've collected about ourselves and coping mechanisms. And there's some really powerful things that the ego mind can do too. Um, like have desires and wants and, and a creative component to it. But, but a lot of the ego mind is made up of coping mechanisms. And when we don't practice observing what exists in the contents of the mind, we just are acting through it. And so if we develop painful stories or we have coping mechanisms like yelling or getting mad or throwing things or, or violence or, or whatever it might be, if we are just working on autopilot all the time, we're not able to step out of that observe and observation is the first step to change. And so mindfulness, meditation and mindfulness based meditation, um, they all bring us to observing ourselves and it's from that point as the observer that we actually have the ability to start creating change and working through patterns that we don't like or that aren't serving us so r in in rain stands for recognize and it's really about getting into that witnessing consciousness and it's it's beautiful because you know there's a similar connection there between eft cbt act and and all these different sort of modalities and when we witness, we stop acting through and we stop giving our energy to these old patterns. And then A stands for allow. And, you know, it's really easy to, to judge ourselves. We've been taught so much about judgment. But if I'm in a state of judging myself, if I do something, you know, let's say 
that I don't like that I do. Maybe I'm saying I'm going to be healthy and go to the gym and I skip the gym and I go against my conscious desire. It's really easy to be like, oh, what's wrong with you? I can't believe you did that. You're being lazy and to judge. But as soon as we judge, we prevent ourselves from understanding. And so wherever we have judgment towards ourselves or to others in our lives, it's very important to adopt an attitude of trying to understand what's happening and and adopt that attitude of inquiry because it's through inquiry that we start being able to change. And so this leads us to our next principle in RAIN, which is I for investigate. And it's about being able to look for, okay, what is the root cause of this? You know, if I, if I don't allow it, I probably am repressing it through judgment. But if I stop judging, I look to investigate, I can go, oh, you know, I'm feeling overwhelmed in these different areas of my life. Maybe I'm working too much or, or whatever it might be. And because I'm, I'm not having boundaries in these areas, I get too tired by the time I say I'm going to go to the gym. And now because I recognized, I allowed and I investigated, I actually get the chance to find a solution instead of if I just judge, then, then I don't even give myself the opportunity to change the root problem that's causing the skipping the gym in the first place is the example. So then I can non-identify. And it's through that non-identification that I'm able to go, okay, what do I need in this situation? What's the, the, the solution to this problem? And I can set those things out into motion for myself. Like, oh, if I set better boundaries at work or I leave earlier or whatever it might be, then I can change and resolve the problem. So not only does it help us to observe our patterns and our contents and really start to self-realize more, but it also helps us to provide for ourselves or for, for others in relationships productive solutions. Well, you know what I would always tell people, because people are looking for tools and you give a lot of them in the book, but the key here is this is a simple one. If they had on their cell phone, a reminder, you know, notification they set for themselves about rain um, and allowed it to come up, you know, a couple of three times a day, because you're trying to change a pattern. I always tell people, and you probably had this too in, in your psychology courses, you know, if a, if a video camera was following you all day long and at the end of the day it played back, would you like what you saw? Mm. Um, would you like what you saw about yourself? And the other thing that's real simple is, you know, and I say this many times, you don't have to believe everything you think. Now, it's a yeah. belief. The, <laughs> the key is the belief, right? Yeah. So those two things, I think, Rain is a great application tool. It's something you could use every day to get yourself repositioned, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Be more mindful. Uh, and I think you've given our listeners just such a, a plethora of just wonderful tools to use. I'm encouraging them to go get the book, Attachment Theory, A Guide to Strengthening the Relationships in Your Life by Thais Gibson, who we've been on with. So Thais, as kind of wrapping this up, if there was anything you wanted to leave with our listeners, we're going to put a link to your website, uh, the personal development school.com. Uh, they can reach out to you there. You have amazing courses and lots of them they can get involved in all with Thais. And for those of you who've been on and hung in, you can understand that Thais is definitely very, very qualified to be speaking about this. What would you tell our listeners as a final note here? I think the overall piece of advice that I would want to give to people is um, if anybody's struggling with any challenge in their life, in their relationship, in, in their workplace, whatever it might be, one of the most important things that we can first do is learn to be kind to ourselves and learn to inquire and seek to understand instead of judge. And it sort of goes in with one of the themes for today, but For change to happen, it's so easy to get caught in these loops of thought, like what's wrong with me or why do I keep doing this or, you know, to blame your relationship or to blame somebody else. And and it really is extremely counterproductive to be doing that. And so when we can start observing ourselves, becoming more mindful and inquiring and adopting an attitude of curiosity to, to understand what is the root cause here? What thoughts or belief patterns am I running? Or what unmet needs exist in my life? And we, when we can be mindful and then start asking ourselves those questions about our beliefs and thoughts or about our unmet needs, 
you'll start to see that through non-identification to the ego mind and being able to witness, that is the first step to then being able to find really beautiful solutions that can open up the world in front of you in a mental emotional way and improve all seven areas of your life as a result. So, you oh, know, like- oh, that's great advice. It's a, you know, self-forgiveness um, and forgiving of others. Right. Mm-hmm. But and importantly, self-forgiveness, because, you know, we beat up on ourselves. Our egos like to do it. I'm not enough. I, you know, I'll never be enough. Uh, whatever that mm-hmm. tape is that's playing. That is such great advice. The other thing that, you know, you speak a lot about is relationships. And, you know, one thing I would leave to the listeners is a relationship project. If there's one person in your life that's agitating you and you've got a picture of them, I've noticed that you can actually change this. Put the picture someplace where you wake up every morning and just send love and compassion to that person. And you'll notice after about 30 days that your whole attitude about that person has changed. Um, and it's an opportunity for you to use a, a spiritual technique to actually change your relationship with people as well. Um, and you'll find that a lot of it is about you. It's not always about them. Um, so... <laughs> You know, these are great opportunities for our listeners. And uh, Thais, are you offering, I noticed at the website, you're offering a 25% special right now. Is there anything particular that you want to tell the listeners about um, the development school? It says at the top with a a code uh, at checkout, use with you at checkout when you go to get the course. I want to make sure that we put that into the blog and you get 25% off. And I would encourage people there. Um, your YouTube channel, we'll put a link to her YouTube channel, uh, Facebook and, uh, her Instagram page so that you guys can check out, uh, personal development school and Thais, the founder. Thais, it's been a pleasure having you on. It's just, it's, it kindred souls when we connect like this. It's just so great. Um, I just want to say namaste to you, blessings, and thanks for being on Inside Personal Growth. Namaste to you and thank you so much for the beautiful work that you do and, and all the people you bring together and, and for being who you are. It's, it's been a privilege and honor to be here today with you. Oh, uh, Likewise as well. We'll make sure we get people to go to personal development school. Thanks so much. Thank you.